All right, hello PurpleCon. Um, today I'm going to be talking to you about, um, well, f in fact, first it turns out I need to say um, I'm from a minority of people in Australia who pronounce the word castle rather than castle. So I hope that everyone will uh, bear with me and not get too freaked out about my strange accent. So let's go on a wonderful journey through Lyman space uh, back in time. <laughs> yeah, th there may be some Lyme puns, um, but we're all Lyme enthusiasts, so that's okay. Um, so I've been into castles since I was a small child. Uh, that's me in my home in Melbourne. That's me in Turkey. Uh, that's me in Wales last year. Um, but as much as I would like to talk solely about castles. Unfortunately, this is uh, at least somewhat of a technology conference, so I need to make this a little bit more relevant to IT. So let's very briefly talk about IT. Uh, and security. So how do we make things secure? Well, um, there's a lot of different approaches to this. Um, one of the more established ones is we go through these series of processes. Um, we do some threat modeling, we do risk assessment, and then we implement security controls. This is, you know, the academic theoretical approach. It's not always necessarily approached this way. So what do these words mean? And uh, this is definitely the driest slide of the presentation. It gets more fun after this. So threat modeling, what is threat modeling? Uh, what are we protecting? Who are we protecting it from? Um, how might they be attacking uh, whatever we're trying to protect? Uh, and then that feeds into the next part, which is risk assessment. So we look at these threats and we say, how much of a risk is this to our organization? What are our risk criteria? How important are these various things that we may be trying to protect? Um, so we use that to prioritize things. And then based on those priorities, we then implement security controls for uh, hopefully trying to eliminate or reduce these risks. Okay, so the main problem with that is, um, well, there's two problems. First of all, extremely boring. Um, and the, the other problem is that, you know, for those of you who uh, have done software engineering for uh, quite some time, um, you probably remember the, the waterfall model, um, <laughs> which uh, some, someone made this cool animation that I blatantly stole from Google Image Search. So thank you, random animation company. Um, so this, this sort of waterfall approach to software development is sort of mirrored a little bit in this approach that we're trying to take to security in that all, a lot of the issues that we have with the waterfall approach to software development uh, also apply equally as much to security. So uh, because we don't like lines and circles are a lot more aesthetic, uh, we replace the waterfall model for the most part with uh, agile software development which has the lot more pleasing circle. And we can do the same thing for security, right? So threat modeling feeds into risk assessment, risk assessment f feeds into security controls, uh, which can then uh, feed back into threat modeling. So we can do it in an iterative approach, um, which helps align security uh, a lot more with modern software development, hopefully. Um, I'm not gonna be talking about threat modeling or risk assessment anymore today, um, which is good, because as I said, they're quite dry topics. Um, specifically only going to be talking about security controls. And uh, a warning for the content, uh, I'm going to be speaking using the magic of metaphors. Now, metaphors uh, can be useful to illustrate points, uh, but when you take them too seriously, uh, they can also be quite problematic. Um, you may even find yourself using phrases like cyber warfare, or unironically, or if you really swallowed the pill, you know, cyber Pearl Harbor. So <laughs> let's just remember that it's just a metaphor. Um, we're not actually building castles, we're still building IT systems. Okay, so that said, come with me now on a journey through Lyme and space. <laughs> so let's rewind the clock about 2,000 years. So you're a humble Lyme farmer <laughs> in your, your village, living peacefully, but unfortunately, your neighbors are not as peaceful and you have some aggressive neighbors who would like to steal your limes. So it's a bit of a lime crisis. 
fortunately, uh, you've developed enough experience to develop a new custom class. So you're no longer a farmer. You've become the village's engineer. So as the engineer, people look to you and say, how can we protect our livestock, our people, and most importantly, our limes? So you say, I have an idea for our village. What we're going to do is we're going to build a wall around it. So congratulations, you've unlocked a tier one Iron Age ring fort, and now your limes are nice and secure within. So there's a lot of advantages to a wall as a security control. Um, you know how to build buildings out of wood, you can build walls out of wood. It's easy, uh, your people already know how to do it, and most importantly, it's better than not having a wall. Okay, so we can say of those things, they're simple. So that, that's our first attribute that we look for in a security control, like it's simple. Now, unfortunately, while you've been leveling up into an engineering class, your aggressive neighbors have also been leveling up and specializing in being attackers. Um, so I've decided instead of Vikings, they're now lime cats. <laughs> so there's our angry lime cat who wants to steal your limes. Okay, so uh, your lime cats look at your wall and say, what different approaches can we take to uh, subverting the security control? Uh, we could burn them down, we could smash them, we could climb over them. There's a number of different ways to bypass this security control. So our security control is simple, it's not very strong. So we put our engineering hat back on and say, all right, let's try and improve this control. Um, so let's make it out of stone. Let's make it higher so it's harder to climb. So we've unlocked a ring fort uh, made of stone. So the advantages, as I said, can't be burned down. It's harder to break harder to climb over. So it's still simple, it's also strong. Will that stop all attackers? Probably not, they're quite determined. Uh, your, your nearby adversaries have decided to spec up again into determined attackers. So you put that engineering hat back on and say, all right, we need to do a little bit more. What else can we do? Well, this wall thing worked out pretty well Let's just build more walls. Uh, so this, this was a pretty common uh, design, multiple walls, uh, with the limes again secure inside there. Um, so a number of advantages to picking this is the additional security control. Um, we already know how to build a wall. It's trivial to build a second one. Uh, and also, they fail independently. So if the attackers break through the outer wall, they then have to break through the inner wall. Um, as well as being a good security defense, uh, this is, can also be uh, quite demoralizing for attackers, um, you know, even in modern times. <laughs> so because they have to defeat those controls independently, we can say they fail independently, right? So what, what do we mean by that? So a counterexample would be uh, a wall and a gate. So if I need to defeat this, I need to either defeat the wall or defeat the gate, either way I'm in. So th that's an example of something that does not fail independently. So our adversaries, are continue, they're continuing to get better. So they have a look at the, our, our multiple wall structure that we've built. And they think, all right, how can we defeat these? And it turns out it's maybe not a great idea because they can say, hey, whatever that thing we used to defeat the first wall, like, we can just do exactly the same thing again to defeat the second wall. If it's ladders, let's use the ladder again. You know, if we smashed a hole in it with axes, like, let's do that again. This is not necessarily a difficult thing to defeat. So where this fails is uh, in diversity. Um, these controls are not diverse. Uh, which is a weakness for multiple controls. So, the, the, you can see there's obviously like this uh, bit of an arms race between uh, defensive engineers and their adversaries who are attacking them. So, if we fast forward the clock um, about a thousand years, so let's, let's leave the Iron Age behind and uh, 
get through to medieval times and have a look at the sort of things you're building then. All right, so here's an example of a medieval castle. Um, lots and lots of limes. So uh, your, your attacker says, okay, let's, let's have a look at what you got. Let's see how we, we could attack this. So they uh, say, okay, let's, let's try and detect what weaknesses are there. So where, where could we attack this castle? All right, so an obvious sort of looking spot would be the gate. You know, let, let's try and go for the gate. Um, but the, the difficulty for a, a attacker is that while they're trying to attack this gate, whether they're trying to batter it open or burn it open or something, is you've got defenders on those walls who can be raining down arrows from a couple of different points on those towers. So you go, okay, this, this doesn't actually sound too entertaining as an attacker. Let's look at somewhere else. Maybe like let's just go in the middle of the wall there. Um, but you sort of got the same problem in that uh, the walls offer the defenders multiple places to, uh, to, to attack the attackers. So is there any points in this castle that where we can sort of uh, focus an attack without being bombarded by you know, multiple arrow archers at once? And yeah, there is. Um, you can only be attacked once. But the, you've then forced the attacker to target the tallest and the thickest part of the fortification. So this is a pretty cool design. Right? And so the, the key takeaway uh, for, for this element of the design is that the point of the walls is not just to defend what's inside the walls. The walls also need to defend themselves. So we call this self-defending, right? So these are the, these are the three attributes um, that we'd look for in an sec individual security control. We want them to be simple, strong, and we want them to be self-defending. Um, those attackers keep on coming. Um, so let, let's look at sort of the, the, the pinnacle of uh, like a medieval castle design, and uh, a really great example of this is uh, this one. This is um, Beaumaris Castle in Wales. So, of course, full of limes again. All right, so multiple stone walls. This is obviously strong, right? We've got uh, one ring of walls, two rings of walls. Um, they need to be defeated separately. So once again, it's independent. Um, but there's something else new that's been introduced here, which is that there's also a moat. Um, so remember the problem with the, um, the, the multiple uh, just walls that were all the same is that they didn't have that diversity. So having a moat introduces this diversity. So the sort of things that you would need to do to defeat a moat, like maybe I'll build a boat or you know, maybe we'll uh, find some other way of fording the moat. Um, you can't then use your boat to attack the walls. Or if you are using ladders to attack the walls, um, where are you going to put them? Like in the moat? Like they, they, uh, the diversity of these controls reinforces them. So uh, take away, security controls are like people. Diversity is great. Okay, so um, you can see they also have that sort of self-defending property in that no matter where you're, um, you're choosing to attack this, you know, whether you're trying to get into the moat, you're trying to get to the walls, um, they have that self-defending property, um, but also because um, the, the inner walls are like taller than the outer walls, um, the inner walls can also help defend the outer walls while the outer walls are defending themselves. So we can say that these controls offer mutual support to each other. Okay, so again, I like people. Mutual support makes teams more resilient and they make security controls more resilient as well. So, um, this looks like a pretty sweet structure. Um, it's strong, it's self-defending, they fail independently, they're diverse, they're mutually supporting. Um, but, obviously a lot of work's gone into this. It sort of gets to the stage where it can no longer be described as simple. Um, and, you know, this, this castle is a great example of this because, uh, so this was built by Edward I when he was... Um, subjugating Wales, basically, um, and it cost a lot of money, um, and it was never finished. 
because they took on too much in this project, and before it was finished, they had a new shiny project um, that they needed to work on in the cloud, no, in Scotland. <laughs> right, so summary of these. So three simple attributes that we look for in individual controls, and three simple attributes that we can use for assessing how they interact with each other. Right? So these, these aren't the only things that we're looking for when we're designing security controls. Um, there's some other important pr principles. Um, reducing attack surface wherever we can. So uh, a great example of this is uh, Mont-Saint-Michel Mont in France. Um, it's going to be really hard to attack that uh, unless you've got a bunch of boats. And even with boats, you're going to have trouble because this is what it looks like at high tide. And at low tide, there's land around it. So some pretty secure limes. <laughs> okay, um, some other uh, things we can think about. Um, segmentation and um, separation of duties are both sort of um, fall under the category of like principle of least privilege. You shouldn't be able to do anything that you don't strictly require, uh, you know, have a business need to do. So, um, Beaumaris Castle isn't really a great example of that because like, if you've made your way inside the outer walls, you can pretty much like walk the entire distance around uh, looking for, oh, where, where can I attack these inner walls? So, and, there's, and there's no real need for that at all. So um, an example of a fortification that sort of takes this principle of least privilege into account um, is this super cool one, which is like sort of at the very end of the age of fortifications. Um, this is Fort Bortange excuse my pronunciation, in the Netherlands. Um, so you can see, like, you know, you get over this moat and onto this bit of land. It's like it doesn't really help you that much. You know, you then have to cross another moat and another bit of land, and, you can, like, lateral movement is virtually impossible. So uh, nice and secure. Okay, so there's some ways that we can assess security controls. But um, as much as I would like to just talk about Castle, we probably should try and... Uh, make this a little bit relevant to tech. Okay, so, scenario. You have a website. It's facing the internet, but you have some, when I say sensitive content, it's, you know, a bit of a loaded word. You know, it's valuable content, content that you don't want other people to see. Um, we only want trusted people to be able to see this content. So, what can we do? Let's put a password on it. Right, so we need a password to access this content. Okay, so let's, let's do an assessment of this as a security control. All right, it's simple. It's pretty straightforward, you know, I could explain it in one sentence. Um, is it strong? All right, well, let's, let's think about it from an attacker's point of view. Um, so to assess the strength of any control, you really need to think about what am I saying it's strong against? So it becomes part of that sort of uh, threat modeling where you can say, how could this be attacked? So for password-based controls, there's some simple ways they can be attacked. Um, an attacker can try and guess the passwords. They can find out where they're stored somewhere, either on the user side or the server side, um, or maybe they can intercept the passwords on the wire. So as is a naive password system, we can't really say that it's a strong control, but we can harden it. So let's like defeat those uh, attacks one at a time. Um, we can use a password complexity policy to attempt to stop people from you know, not using simple passwords. Obviously, this is a problematic area that's been discussed a bit today. Um, let's gloss over that. Uh, enforcing TLS, so uh, we don't do any plain text communication with the site um, can, that will hopefully uh, resolve the issue of it being observed on the wire. Uh, and at least when we store it, uh, we'll use strong hashes on the server side. Um, still a little bit problematic in terms of how users might store the password, um, but that's out of scope. Okay. <laughs> so we can say it's strong. Is this a self-defending control? Well, again, it depends on what you, how you implement it, but like, let's just say you know, you've done it in the most naive way. It's not really self-defending, because if I can do things like uh, 
trying to brute force the password. You know, if I can send 10,000 password attempts, um, you can't really say it's self-defending. But again, it's easy to harden this to make it self-defending. So how can we do that? So, so, okay, you get one attempt at trying to get your password right, and if you get it wrong and you need to go again, it's like you need to enter your password and a capture. So, so that's, that's a way that it can defend itself uh, against attacks, against this control. Okay, so cool. Um, we've got three ticks for this. Sounds like a pretty good control. But as we know, uh, single security control isn't always going to be the best defense against a determined attacker. Because um, it's, it's sort of, you know, all the eggs are in one basket. It's like, if this control fails, uh, everything fails. So maybe a second security control is called for. So I'm going to pick something that um, you probably shouldn't pick, just as a, as a bad example. So as well as a password, I want you to uh, answer a secret question or a security question. Um, like, you know, the what street did your dog grow up on um, type thing. So uh, really quickly, is it simple? Yeah, definitely. Is it strong? No, like the answer space is like tiny. This is not great. Um, is it self-defending? Like, let's say we're doing the capture thing again. So, okay, let's, let's say yes for self-defending. Um, so those two controls. So the second one isn't looking as good as the first, but we're, we're putting them together, right? So like maybe the fact that the second control isn't that strong isn't really a problem. Um, so we, but we do need to look at how they interact with each other, right? So look, looking at these things. So in terms of them failing independently, you need to look, if one fails, what will happen to the other one, right? If I guess your password, I'm probably not going to guess the street that your dog grew up on. If I access where the password's been stored, yeah, I probably am going to see you know, the, the answer to the other question like written down right next to it, you know, whether that's in a database somewhere or whether that's the, the client's written that information down. Um, if I'm able to intercept your password on the wire, I'm definitely going to be able to intercept the, the secret answer on the wire as well. So in terms of them being able to fail independently, it's like, yeah, not really. It's, uh, you know, maybe a little bit. Um, you know, this, this, this idea of a sec second security control, like it feels a lot like this, hey, we've built a wall, like let's just build more walls. All right, so th th they're obviously not diverse. Um, and you could implement these in a sort of mutually supporting way, um, but it would probably be difficult to do. So the, in the way that they interact with each other, um, it's obviously like not particularly helpful, this second control. So let's consider a different second control. So instead of a, a secret answer, um, let's require a password and a one-time password. So, you know, like Google Authenticator, um, you know, even uh, an SMS, um, a YubiKey token. Um, uh, I'm going to leave um, part of the analysis of these as an you know, exercise for the reader in the interest of time. Um, but it's simple, it's strong, it's self-defending, um, and there are sort of no ways that these sort of interact negatively from each other. So um, this is clearly a much better secondary control. Um, so don't, don't just take my word for it, like NIST, uh, in 2016, like change their tune on knowledge-based authentication. They say, don't do it. Um, so what, what else could we do to help secure our website? Like we could try and apply some of these other principles. So like, how could we reduce the attack surface? It's like, well, the, the classic way of reducing the attack surface of any um, tech uh, system is um, if you can do it as a network layer, that's fantastic. So, you know, only allow people from a trusted source IP address to log in, uh, which can be difficult to do, or require people to VPN into a trusted network first. Um, there's, a, there's a number of different ways that we can um, sort of reduce the attack surface. So in summary of assessing these controls, you know, we've got the ways of assessing them individually and ways of assessing them, how they interact with each other. Um, so. This is really helpful in assessing 
security controls, but there's definitely questions that this approach does not answer. So questions like, how many controls are enough? Like, when am I done? Uh, which is like a perennial problem in security. It's like, how much security is needed? Um, and the answer to that is we need to go back to the bit where we were yawning, which is the threat modeling. So we look at our security controls have been implemented. Let's look at the threats, you know, which ones of those have been addressed, which haven't. Let's do a risk assessment on the residual risk. And are we happy with where we are? Or is there still an unacceptable level of risk? In which case, it's time to implement more security controls. That's it. I've been Liam. You've been PurpleCon. Thank you very much. <laughs>